Mental health reform is one of the top priorities in Olympia this session. How are lawmakers planning to fix the troubled system, and how will the state pay for it? He had voices in his head constantly. For Washington state families in distress, the stigma of mental illness and the lack of access to the right care can be devastating. We got to get a handle on this. It's costing us a fortune. It's ruining lives. Is more localized help the right solution? The research tells us that people should heal within their own community. Are lawmakers focusing on the right mental health priorities? We are in the midst of a children's mental health crisis. Our studio panel weighs in. There will need to be resources behind these services. We need to look at, at models outside of just locked institutions. Finding and funding fixes to our flawed mental health care system. Next on City Inside Out. Welcome to this edition of City Inside Out. I'm your host, Brian Callanan. After years of setbacks from the decertification of Western State Hospital, to a growing wait list of mentally ill patients needing help. State lawmakers say they are poised to make some major changes to our behavioral health care system. Legislators are reworking a $675 million proposal from Governor Inslee to increase community-based treatment options, improve the criminal behavioral health system, build a new psychiatric teaching hospital, and other priorities. This effort has gained bipartisan support and could be buoyed by a windfall of new state revenue. But advocates warn, a behavioral health system that has been neglected for so long will take years to recover. His life dream was to work for NASA. The talent of Todd Crook's son, Chad, can be clearly seen in his designs of spaceships and other intricate artwork. What you can't see is the schizophrenia Chad was diagnosed with at age 20. The disease progressed and progressed to where he had voices in his head constantly. Despite what Todd calls a Cadillac health insurance plan, plus help and support from his parents and three siblings, Chad lost hope. He saw what happens to somebody with prolonged schizophrenia and saw the people in the tents and the people on the streets. Well, we lost Chad to suicide on January 21st in 2016. Soon after, Todd and his wife Laura began the Chad's Legacy Project to help other families. Experts say one in five people in the U.S. are dealing with some form of mental illness. We realize that this is something much bigger than just a couple of parents talking about what happened to their son. Todd helped establish the State Mental Health Summit, has led work groups, and has joined a steering committee to recommend changes in Olympia regarding children's mental health, changes that he believes are underway in the 2019 session. It's not fixed by any means, but it is it is kind of the start of something new and exciting. So many of our people are suffering and dying. One major change lawmakers are considering, the first bill Speaker Frank Chop has been the prime sponsor of in 20 years, is to build a new behavioral health campus within the UW School of Medicine. We have a huge workforce shortage in all mental health professions, including psychiatrists. Doctors say the facility would provide some much needed training, plus new treatment beds. For a state ranked 49th out of 50 for psychiatric beds, in a 2015 State Institute for Public Policy report. We have challenges there because we don't have enough capacity to be providing people what they need. Representative Lori Jenkins of the 27th District in Tacoma says our system needs help at all stages, from the community level to civil commitments and criminal cases involving mental illness too. We have not done a very good job of investing in treatment for mental health. Jenkins is working on a bill to respond to the True Blood lawsuit of 2014, where a federal judge ruled our state violated the rights of mentally ill patients by warehousing them in jails. <laughs> Jenkins' bill calls for forensic navigators and other resources to help mentally ill people become competent to stand trial and ultimately 
stay out of the criminal justice system. Charges will get dismissed on many, many of these folks because once their mental health is stable, they are not going to be doing kind of certain behaviors in community that cause them to be charged with crimes. We got to get a handle on this. Senator Keith Wagner of the 39th District in Cedro Woolley says dealing with the True Blood suit and continued problems at Western State Psychiatric Hospital have pushed lawmakers to propose major changes to our state's behavioral health system. Sometimes big problems like this warrant pushing the envelope of what we're familiar with. Wagner, the ranking Republican on the newly formed Behavioral Health Subcommittee, says over the long term, Western and Eastern state hospitals should not be the primary options for mental health care. He says smaller locally based facilities near a patient's family and support networks can provide better outcomes. We want to put more resources in local communities so people are taken care of at the beginning of their need rather than waiting years and then being stuffed away in a big state institution. Paying for these new facilities presents a challenge. Thank you very much. You do some great work here. While Wagoner agrees with much of the $675 million mental health overhaul plan presented by Jay Inslee in late 2018, he doesn't like the capital gains tax the governor suggested as one way to pay for it. Along with using new state revenue coming in, Wagoner supports a bill that would ask voters to approve the expansion of our state's bonding capacity to build new treatment centers quickly in the years ahead. We can invest that money in the facilities to fix people, and I think it's a wise move. It's one move of many by state lawmakers that has Todd Crook's attention this session. He's especially keeping an eye out on bills that would help young people. Fact remains, we're still losing youth. The state has been considering bills to mandate mental health education in our schools and help give parents more access to their teen children's mental health treatment. It's a, a, a long game. But it's unclear if the bills he's backing are still in play. Todd acknowledges he may not get everything he wanted this legislative session, but it's a start that gives him and thousands of other families in our state trying to tear down the stigma of mental illness some hope. If the legislature does their job, then a year to two years from now, that will help a lot of the people like Chad. Some big issues ahead for our state when it comes to mental and behavioral health. We're here to break them down with a great panel we have with us. Dr. Eric Bruns is a clinical psychologist, also a professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at the University of Washington School of Medicine. Eric, great to have you. It's a pleasure to be here. We also have with us Laura Van Tosh. She is an advocate who brings a viewpoint of lived experience to this conversation. Great to have you too, Laura. Thank you. And finally, we have Brad Forbes. He is director of public policy and advocacy for NAMI Washington. That's the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Brad, good to have you too. Thanks. Here we go. Uh, Dr. Bruns, I want to start with you. I'm thinking about community care, civil commitments, forensic and criminal cases. What are the biggest issues you think our state needs to be taking on? And, and please give us a little bit about your background as you answer that question. Absolutely. So um, I'm a, a clinical psychologist who focuses on children's mental health research as well as a practitioner. We stand in solidarity with uh, parents like, uh, like Todd who have lost children. And when you talk about pushing resources into the community and you're talking about children's mental health, our feeling is, is that the number one thing we can do is ensure that kids have access to mental health practitioners where they spend the majority of their time, mm -hmm. which is in schools. Mm. Investing in school mental health is something that myself and my colleagues feel as though is going to be our greatest investment in trying to be able to intervene early uh, with kids who might be showing symptoms such as those that uh, Chad did. Yeah. Um, I mean, we cannot avoid the fact that if we want to zoom out to the, the biggest issue here, that yeah. we are in the midst of a children's mental health crisis. I mean, once upon a time when I started my career, we would say one in six, one in five kids sure. have, a, have a diagnosed mental health problem. We're talking about one in four now with mm. depression, uh, anxiety, uh, post-traumatic stress, yeah. the onset of schizophrenia like yeah. Chad. Yeah. Um, and as a, as a parent of a, of a young girl, a school-aged school age girl, it's very distressing to see our own data showing that one in four uh, teenage girls contemplate suicide. Mm. One in eight are going to attempt it. It's about investing in early yeah. intervention in schools with a yeah. comprehensive strategy. And I know it's one of many uh, priorities that the state's trying to wrestle with. Thanks for bringing that up. Laura, you bring a very important personal perspective to this conversation. I want you to tell us your story and what you think the state's top priority should be when it comes to behavioral health. 
Well, I, I, first of all, I am a person with uh, mental health issues. And many years ago, I was a patient at Western State Hospital and was able to leave um, a, at an appropriate time and go back to the community. Mm -hmm. um, I'm an advocate that's worked in several different states, including Washington. Mm -hmm. And about a quarter of a century later, I worked at Western State Hospital as the director for consumer affairs. Mm -hmm. um, I've worked in mental health policy and worked with other researchers on systems issues. And I think at this point, um, uh, the system is, people say it's in a crisis and that our system is broken, but I really believe that we haven't taken enough time to really sit down and make some carefully thought out decisions about next steps. And our session this year has been sort of a rush to get some things accomplished. Mm -hmm. um, without really people like myself at the table to mm -hmm. participate, quite frankly. Um, and I have raised that issue in a number of places, including public testimony in Olympia. Yeah. Um, and that's really a big concern among people with mental health issues that, quite frankly, have a lot to offer. Um, mm -hmm. If you listen you know, carefully, um, we have many answers, we have many perspectives. Mm -hmm and viewpoints that I think can lend itself to some of the solutions. Thank you, and we'll be, we'll be hearing a lot more of your perspective okay. today. I appreciate you bringing that sure. up. Uh, Brad, let's bring you in here. Give us a brief overview of what NAMI is and maybe your thoughts on the most important issues you want to see our state deal with this session. Sure, so the National Alliance on Mental Illness is the nation's uh, largest and oldest grassroots advocacy organization advocating for the well-being of people living with mental illness and their families. Mm -hmm. uh, throughout Washington State, we have 20 offices that offer, at the local level, people um, services such as support groups and community education programs um, to, again, advocate for people with mental illness and their family members. Um, and when I think about the current legislative session, I think that we have a great opportunity to really shift the conversation in how we address mental health issues at a statewide level. Uh, for a very long time, our state has focused funding on the crisis end of the spectrum, which is to say inpatient care at Western and Eastern state hospitals. Um, and we're really wanting to use this opportunity to move that conversation earlier towards prevention and early intervention, um, which will not only save the state resources in crisis care, um, but will also save individuals and families the heartache of having to go through the process of watching people get sick enough that they need that kind of care. Yeah, and it really Really seems like we're at the start of a process that is going to take years here. We have to be very honest about that. I want to move ahead if I can and talk about this overarching issue that I'm hearing from the legislature, the idea to move away from the large institution model towards smaller local facilities. Western State Hospital, a lot of problems there that people have seen, certainly decertified by federal inspectors. Lawmakers are trying to take a different approach. Eric, what are your thoughts on this idea of more community-based care, smaller treatment centers, closer to patients and their support networks? Well, it's clearly the way to address the problem more proactively. Um, I think that the legislature has made some great strides with the idea of a teaching hospital that will increase both the yeah. number of beds that we have available, but even more importantly, uh, that facility and others that would provide community-based care. Right. At this point, it's just a question of trying to get the strategies aligned. Um, they're not 100% aligned in some ways, especially with the school mental health priorities yeah. that have been uh, advanced. And the other big thing is we've got to resource it in the same way that some of the resources are being proposed for addressing the adult mental health crisis. Yeah. We haven't seen a whole lot of uh, collective political will to actually do what we need to do, which is to put uh, well-trained uh, uh, and, and compassionate people in schools where the yeah. kids are to try and help yeah. the school climate overall and also treat kids when, they, when their needs emerge. And we're going to dive more into that school model in just a little bit here, but Lauren, maybe I can bring you in here and two questions if I could. Do you think a smaller facility would have been more helpful to you while you were going through treatment and also with regard to your administrator role at, at Western there, can you give us a perspective on the state's move to create more of these facilities, more beds in local areas rather than the state institution model? Well, to be clear, um, a bed is a bed. And quite frankly, these beds are going to be within facilities where the, the patients will be civilly committed. Um, so this isn't sort of a, a cabana as opposed to a hotel. Mm. It's, it's basically a large, I grew up in Florida, so mm -hmm. that just came out. But, That's all right. Oh. Um, but this is really a place where people will be in locked facilities, and I think that needs to be you know, put out there pretty quickly pretty upfront. Yeah. Um, 
as far as I'm concerned, community care is really the way to go. Uh, however, we need to look at, at models outside of just locked institutions. I do know that the governor and others would like to make Western State Hospital um, a forensic center for excellence. And I think we need to look at the conditions there, physically the structure, yeah. and the treatment that would be provided there. Um, most people that I know um, are not happy with the community beds. They'd like to see community-based services such as peer-run, patient-run alternatives in the community, which are all over the country, yeah. peer respite, which are alternatives to inpatient hospitalization. Um, so some of those issues kind of fell out and have not been included uh, fully, um, again, going back to listening to patients in the construct of the of the overall transformation plan yeah. at the beginning, we might have seen some of those things included uh, now. Yeah. Um, I do know that people would prefer to be closer to home in general, yeah. but I don't know if I were to choose being on the street or being in a community-based hospital, uh, civilly committed, um, I'd probably choose the street. Mm. And I know people who would definitely prefer the street over uh, psychiatric institutions. I, I really appreciate your perspective there, Laura. And Brad, let me bring in here. I wanted to get your take on this community-based healthcare mm -hmm. uh, piece. And you've heard Laura's concerns here. I also wanted to throw in the concerns of groups like the Association of Washington Cities. They're wondering where do these facilities get cited? Will there be enough support services around them for them to work? Would they have a negative impact on communities? Help us with mm -hmm. some of these ideas, please. Yeah, so uh, Governor Inslee would like the uh, civil commitments to be moved out of the state hospitals into the community setting in five years. Um, and in that time, uh, there will be a lot of conversations at the local government level about um, siting and what these facilities will look like, where they will be, who will staff them and, and be in them. Having people receive more intimate care closer to home um, is the general direction to go versus the state hospital model um, because it helps to ease the transition from civil commitment back into the community when yeah. people are in the community nearer to their families and friends in uh, settings with which they are familiar. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think that, as was mentioned a little earlier, mm -hmm. uh, making sure that, that these uh, local facilities are resourced is um, really uh, the, the crux of yeah. the issue um, right. because folks do need to make sure that they have full service while they're there and then yeah. also uh, case management when they transition back mm -hmm. into the community um, and for example um, making sure that people have a roof over their head because right. the only way a person can possibly stay in recovery is if they have a place to call home. Some stable housing. And I, I know they've been talking a lot about the wraparound services that are involved here. Please, Laura. Yes, but one thing we haven't talked about which is integral to the the new bed bill mm -hmm. yeah. um, in Olympia is the fact that the state um, legislature is looking at broadening the commitment law yes. um, within the state and gravely disabled, by the way, which was the standard for committing people not to get into the weeds. No, no, no. But um, this was the first state that had gravely disabled in, in the United States. Yeah. And now I think we'll be one of the first that have this broadened law that would actually bring in more people into the beds yeah. and into the system. Okay. And that includes young people as yeah, well, people right. under 18. And as someone who really cares about patients' rights, I think that's something to sort of combine the commitment law with yeah. the beds. Right. And if the beds are in full, the state does not get reimbursement from the federal government. So there's this this sort of fuel for the beds. The hand in the glove um, there, and we yeah. Just, yeah. I really hope, and I think people are really carefully thinking about these sure. issues, and right. I greatly appreciate that. And, and I want to add a wrinkle, and Brad, I want to lean on your expertise a little bit more here, talking about the forensic side of things. Mm -hmm. The true blood decision, a judge ruled our state could not warehouse the mentally ill in jails as they are right now. Uh, in response to that, Representative Jenkins looking for ways to get more mentally ill people into treatment. She wants to help people become competent to stand trial so they're not mm -hmm. in the criminal justice system. Let us know what's going on here. Is the state taking the right approach here? Um, they are. Um, increasing the number of evaluators to make sure that people that need an evaluation to see if they're competent to stand trial um, is a good way to start. Um, to make sure that folks don't sit in jail and, and languish for weeks or we've even heard stories of months on end. Yeah. Um, but I think the, the bigger issue is to make sure that people don't end up in jail in the first place. Mm. Um, so for example, giving law enforcement officers options other than taking people to jail if it's very clear that a behavioral health 
uh, struggle Issue, is yeah. the reason the yeah. person is acting the way uh, the way that they are that led them to be arrested in the first place. Got it. Um, and really making sure that um, with both the criminal justice system and also, as I mentioned earlier, with the civil commitment system, making sure that discharge services are available um, to uh, make sure that people get directly connected to uh, social services in their community. Yeah. Um, you can't just uh, hand somebody, for example, a sticky note saying, here's who to call to right. receive services. Yeah. You have to really make sure that people um, who in many cases have already been declared incompetent yes. to stand trial yeah. uh, can receive services to keep themselves stable. This is part of that forensic navigator piece that I know yes. Representative Jenkins has talked about. Yeah, Forensic navigators are crucial. Mm -hmm. um, I have experience in uh, criminal justice uh, with, with those issues yeah. and quite frankly in a place where there was nothing like that. Yeah. Um, and to have someone walk alongside in those circumstances is not only a support, yeah but navigating actually a very complicated system. I think it's critical. Which is yeah. really hard to do when yeah. you're, you know, having, when you're experiencing a crisis. Yeah, yeah. Eric, yeah, please. I would just say that I would be remiss as a uh, mental health services researcher not to also uh, comment that um, whether we're talking about adult community-based services or the services that are available to our children mm -hmm. in clinics or in schools, yeah. we also have got to figure out ways to invest in the infrastructure to provide uh, the services that have been shown by research to be effective, mm -hmm. because we have seen that community-based services, school-based services, wraparound kinds of interventions mm -hmm. um, can, can be uh, uh, relatively ineffective if they're workforce is not supported to do things, yes. the, the models or the versions of the models that have been shown to work. Yeah. Okay, very important point. And I want to stay with you if I can, Eric, and just talk a little bit more about the school issue because in Olympia there's a few different pieces at work here. <clears throat> Increasing mental health monitoring, counseling at the schools, a plan to require mental health instruction, uh, another to give parents more control of their teens' mental health mm -hmm. treatment. A lot of issues here. Yeah. Can you help me with some of these different issues, what you're keeping an eye on, where you want our state to go when it comes to our young people? Let's, let's hone this in. Sure, again, I mean, there's been some great activity and some really good ideas that have been put into the pieces of legislation that yeah. we've seen this session. We've seen uh, pilot programs around uh, telepsychiatric -psychi consultation mm -hmm. to uh, school staff when kids show uh, potential need for help. We've seen um, early uh, mental health uh, consultation programs being proposed. Um, we've seen support to school counselors to be able to pitch in yes. uh, to become mental health supports for the students in their schools. Mm -hmm. um, but again, there hasn't really been a whole lot of uh, coordinated effort to put something together that's really cohesive and represents a state strategy. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing that's concerning is, again, the, the level of resource. Um, we've seen uh, $8 million over th uh, each year for three years proposed for school safety teams, for yeah. example, that would not be people in the schools, but would be outside in educational uh, service districts and other yeah. um, things like that. Right. Um, and, you know, these are focused on relatively low incidence events that are tragic and horrible, such as school shootings and right. being able to respond to natural disasters. Right. But when you consider that we lost 80 school-aged kids to suicide last yeah. year, yeah. and um, that would be the, the equivalent of um, having uh, an event such as the tragic event in Marysville Pilchuck happening yeah. twice a month right. for every month of the school year. Yeah. We need to invest in people who are going to be in the school and figuring out how to make the schools safe places for all yeah. students, yeah. make sure that we're actually creating a climate of yeah. safety and yeah. where we're identifying kids early yeah. um, and, and investing in buildings as opposed to some of these uh, intermediary kinds of things or these pilot programs. Right, and Laura, I want to bring in, and then uh, we'll bring in Brad, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to add to what Eric is saying, and I'm not sure if you're if you're doing this yet, but but I think including young people in the work that you're doing yeah. is just Absolutely. fabulous, yeah. as well as graduates, people who are a little bit older that can actually, you know, maybe handle some of the the, the difficult things of having to recall yeah. things that have happened to them. Um, but I also know Todd Crooks, who yep. is featured today. Um, he's very focused on also mental health education among children uh, yeah. in schools, and um, that's very, very important. There, there is another bill yeah. about Narcan, which is having Narcan uh, for people who, are, who, you know, hopefully prevent overdose. I see, right. And that, that might be moving forward um, uh, for, for students as well in yeah. schools. So we're, we're kind of using schools as a place for support and, yeah. in a way, some treatment, but... One caution, though, I think when we have professionals in schools, um, just be sure that that we're not, um, if, if medication is provided, mm -hmm. that we don't over-medicate or, sure. or start dealing with some of those slippery slope issues yeah. that... Um, 
that, that do come up with young people. Always a concern. Thank I, you. And I yeah. think that you know, effective school mental health uh, models are really primarily focused on providing group-based yeah. and, and individual counseling and support for students, as well as kind of yeah. uh, those, those uh, individual yeah. professionals who are in the schools can yeah. create entire prevention models yeah. that uh, can serve all the students yeah. in a school. And Brad, I know you wanted to say something here quickly. Yeah, yeah I wanted to um, add on to uh, what you were saying, Laura, um, and, and say that making sure that uh, young people have a stake in their own mental health care in yeah. the schools is really important um, because there are a lot of ideas about ways that, a lot of important ideas about ways that adults and, uh, can support youth um, to improve their mental health, but um, making sure that we're teaching young people about their own mental health. Um, you know, about half of serious mental illness presents itself by the time a person turns 14. Right. And um, giving uh, young people, specifically high school students, the opportunity yeah. um, to learn, uh, for example, in health class about their own mental health will work to destigmatize the issue to say, yeah. if yeah. you're hearing voices, for example, like that's okay, there's nothing. Um, per se wrong with you yeah. um, and also that there is help available yeah. and giving uh, young people the tools they need to sort of get ahead of the issues yeah. earlier on in the process. And we need to wrap up the show. I feel like we could go on for another hour here. I really appreciate this. Can you give me the 20 second version? Last words of advice for the state legislature going forward here, please. Um, we are uh, at a really important time in improving the mental health care delivery system in our state. And in order to move from the crisis-based system that we, uh, that we have to a more uh, broad prevention and early intervention um, system will uh, take resources. And so it's really important to remember that this is long-term and that um, there'll need to be resources behind these services to maintain them for the long run. Discussion how we pay for it. Laura, the brief version, if you could. Yes. What do you want to tell our legislators here? <laughs> Stop. No, 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 please. No, no, yeah. no, no. Um, the, the, train, the train is on the track running. And I know that, and, and thankfully I can, I can see that and be uh, mature about that. Mm -hmm. But I would say to please leave the door open because I think some of the changes have come so fast that we're gonna need to be nimble and on our feet to be able to make quick changes if we need to around a, a foundations that, that has already been laid, yeah. um, uh, that we just need to be on our on the balls of our feet and and I think the other thing is is really and I've testified on this as well is that we really need to rely on data and yeah. reliable data yeah. and data that we can make public so that other people can also see that data has been used in making these big policy decisions. Thank you. If you can wrap it up briefly, I would, Eric. Yeah. I would just say that we have seen other states respond to horrible tragedies like the uh, Parkland shooting with governors bringing together their health care authority equivalents and their education leaders yeah. and saying, how are we going to get uh, comprehensive, accountable, data-driven, mm -hmm. research-based school mental health in yeah. every one of our schools? And they're yeah. investing 20, 30 million dollars a yeah. year in it. Washington can be a leader like those states. We're talking about places like South Carolina, yeah. Georgia, mm -hmm. Minnesota, Nevada. Washington should get on, on that bandwagon, make okay. sure that we are supporting our students where they uh, spend most of their time outside of their homes. Thank you for all of this, and we will be right back. I think parents need to have more control um, over their adolescents' mental health issue. I think you have to fund the money in the right way. Intervention for the mentally ill is really important because it's, it's a big part of the homeless problem. Our state basically just needs to pay attention. We'd like to know what you think. Send us an email at contact at seattlechannel.org or find us on Facebook and Twitter and give us your feedback. Before we close today, it's time for our weekly CIO poll. Do you support a new state bond for more community-based mental health facilities in Washington? Yes, no, or are you undecided? We want to know what you think. Cast your vote and send us your comments at our website, seattlechannel.org slash cityinsideout. While you're there, you can watch our programs online anytime. Coming up next week, fighting climate change in Washington state. Lawmakers are considering bills for new clean fuel standards and a 100% carbon-free electrical grid within 25 years, but critics are pushing back. We take a look at both sides of this heated issue next time on City Inside Out. I hope you join us.